Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can we start this service by giving God a praise? I mean, just a look outside the, that beautiful blue sky, that white snow. I mean, it almost makes you think that there's still change to this world, isn't there? But you know what? You know, we've been talking all, you know, you see the prayer requests on the board. And, you know, regardless of anything, God is still in control. And that's what we need to keep first and foremost in our mind, is that, you know, whether this person is sick or whether this person is sick or whether things blow up in uh, Tennessee or whether the shootings, God is still in control, people. And we need to stand in affirmation of that, to know that, you know, because people do look at the church. People do look to see. There's a lady that I work with. She's always telling me, you know, as a Christian, you may be the only Bible that some people read. So they're looking to you, Randall. They're looking to you, Gary. They're looking to us to see how we're going to react to all these situations. And if we're running around thinking that, oh, the world is lost and everything like that, which it is, but, you know, we need to be uh, in agreement, showing them that we have the answer, right? Okay. With that, I'll... Um, I don't have any prayer requests, so just remember the families that have lost loved ones. Um, those you have, Blake? Ryan and my kids. Your sister, Robin? Quit smoking. Does she needs to quit smoking? Yes. Oh. Okay, so just remember this request. Is there any unspoken requests? Did anybody ask? God sees those. So, uh, <coughs> I'll say a quick prayer and then we'll do our tithes and our offerings and we'll get the service started. We just surrender to you, Lord, Heavenly Father. We come to you thankful, people, Lord, just believing and knowing and trusting in your promises that everything that happens here has already been approved by you. And we know that though the devil may uh, have evil towards us, you turn it for, to good. We know that we can stand on that promise because us being your children, Lord, we know that you have us safe in the palm of your hands. So, Lord, lead us and guide us as you see fit. We'll give you the glory, the honor, and praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. All this said, amen. Good night. Okay, we'll go ahead and do our tithes and our offerings. James, would you say the last one? Father God, we yes. thank you for allowing us to be in your house today on this last Sunday of the year, Lord. We do hope next year is a little better. We ask your blessings on this service this morning and on this offering. We give to the giver, those that have to give and those that have not. And as always, we ask you to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and soon coming King. Amen. Amen. from the book of Isaiah in chapter 41. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That was God speaking through Isaiah, a promise to watch over us, protect us, uphold us, and keep us strong in him. So why should we fear? Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. Oh, well, we're all standing. <laughs> and you can tell I'm nervous this morning. Um, we're going to sing Joy to the World. So what, what page, Brother Charles? Page 235. Grab you a hymn and let's sing. Page 235. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Yeah. Let the earth Amen. receive her king. Yeah. It'd be nice if the earth would receive her king. Yes, it would.
Give God a praise worship that we've had. Bless his heart. He, he depends on that technology, and technology has let us all down at one time or another, hasn't it? You can't, can't really depend. But I, I tell you what, <clears throat> I'm so blessed by this guy. And whew, well, I ain't going to cry, but I tell you, <clears throat> I, I just appreciate him doing what he does. I really do. Because uh, he, he does it for the Lord. And that's what makes a difference. 
Good to see the Billy Edmonds family here with us this morning. So, congratulations, got the got the little guy there. I'm telling you, did he drive you guys over here today? So, yeah, I figured he would. Won't be long. That'll be happening. So, oh, I trust all of you had a merry Christmas. I know the majority of you had a white one, and <laughs> uh, quite a bit of difference. Somebody said that 2020. Uh, got one thing right, and that was we got a white Christmas out of the deal. So I guess that, that made the difference. We're going to talk about the Word becoming flesh. I know that's a, that, that's a pretty common theme, but I think sometimes we just kind of look at these things and take them for granted and kind of read into it, uh, and we just kind of put it in a context, in a perspective, and it really don't become a part Uh, of our everyday lives. It seems to be a seasonal type thing that we talk about maybe at Christmas or or whatever. But we we have got used to it 2,000 and some years down the road. It's become pretty commonplace for us. But but I'm telling you, that was a big deal when, when that happened back in that first century when Christ came. It was something we're used to because we've read about it, we preach about it, we praise, we study about it, and sometimes we lose the real impact of what it really has on our lives. So if you would, turn to the first chapter of the book of John. John chapter 1, and I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able, and if you're not, I understand that as well. You don't have to, but we're going to honor God as we read His Word. I've got 16 verses for you coming up. I forgot to put them in, Pam. I'm sorry, my fault. But uh, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, we got these words recorded by the evangelist. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light, to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld His glory, John says, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Thank God. Father, we thank you today in the name of Jesus for these who are able to be with us here in service today. Give them a double portion of your blessing, I pray, as we study this word together here this morning. Those who are tuned in and watching us, and those who may tune in later, we pray that Holy Spirit, you just guide and direct them into the message as you're going to do for us here today. And we give you the thanks and the praise, Jesus, for all of it, because it's all about you. You're the reason for the season, and you're the reason we're here. So open this word up to us, just as you opened it up to Brother John to put the words down. And we'll thank you for it. In your name, Jesus, we say it, and the saints would say, we love you, Lord. Amen, amen. You can be seated. Oh, the Word became flesh. 
Now, I don't know if you've given a lot of thought to that or not. It, it, you may really don't. You know, the, the majority of us who, who are Christians and, and who, are, who are just not that in-depth into theology or who just don't study it or who don't make a living preaching the Word, you know, you can understand. And you think for the most part, part there's just things that you know and those are the things that you really only need to know. And that's all right. You, you don't have to, to go in depth and get any deeper. But, but I'm a thinker. I'm, I'm an analyzer. That just happens to be my type personality. And, and I kind of like to know how things work and why they work. And, you know, when, you, when you're talking about God, there's one thing I've learned a long time ago. And God doesn't deal in logic, does he? God's a, God's a type God that he does what he wants to do when he wants to do it how he wants to do it, whether it makes sense to me or not. It's always for my benefit. It's always for our benefit. But there are things we don't understand. Well, this is one of the things when, when you look back and you read over the Gospels, and John's the only one that makes this claim in the sense that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and you think, well, when did, when did it become the Word? How do we put that into perspective? We, we have always said, well, we know who Jesus is and, and we know what He has done for us and we know what He's able to do. We know what He's still doing. But how, how did John come about calling Him the Word? How, how did that come into play? And how does it continue to play out in our lives today? Well, it all starts, of course, in the Old Testament. It all started with, with the Jews, who were the people that God had chosen to bring His Word to the rest of the world. That's what He did. And we know that in the outstart, how it began, it began with Father Abraham. It began with, with Abram in the beginning. So to Jews, God and His Word were one in the same. It, it was not like there was God and then there was the Word of God. When they talked about God, they, they knew that God was the Word, the Word, or the message. We get that from Genesis. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, here's where it comes from. After these things, the Word of the Lord. Now, now the, the italics and underlining is mine. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, the word speaking, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. See that connection? See, it, see how they make the word God? The word came speaking. We, we often say, well, God speaks the Word. Yeah, because He is the Word. Now, John understood that. John knew that. He knew that the Jews did not separate the Word of God from God Himself. It was not as if there was God and then He gave us a Word as if to say, well, I'm God. This is who I am. But this is what you've got to do. This is what you're going by. no. He, he's the same. There's no difference between Him and the message. There's no difference between Him and the Word. I guess it goes back to saying, as in our day and time, we may say one thing, yet do another. That, that's just something that, that tends to be part of human nature. Uh, you've always heard it say, do as I say and not as I do. Well, it doesn't happen that way with God. He, he does what He says because He is what He says. That's who He is. He is the Word. Now, here's why John chose to, to call Jesus the Word when he wrote his Gospel. He makes it clear to us that God Himself became a human being. Now, to you, that's not hard for you to grasp. You believe that. That's why you're here. That's why you're here to worship. You don't have any doubt that, that Jesus was fully God. But there are those who, who may, and there are those who don't understand that, and especially the other, 
the other assemblies, the other religions that are out there today, do you realize that our Savior, who is the only true God, but He is the only founder of any kind of religion that can make the claim that He Himself is the religion. He Himself is it in general. All the other religions, they have, they have leaders, or they may have founders, and they may lift them up, but the religion is bigger than they are. The religion is bigger than the founder. And there are so many differences and so many beliefs. And, so, and that's not true with our God. Our Savior is the same as He says He is. There's no difference between who He says He is and who He actually is. And John wanted to point that out to the Jews. Why was that? Because they were in a world not different from our world. They were in political turmoil. They, they were living, listen, it had been over 400 years since that world had heard anything new, so to speak, from the Word of God. With Malachi ending his, his prophecies, it was 400 years before anything else happened. Now 400 years is a long time. Time. Our nation is just a little over 200 years old. 400 years is a big span for nothing to happen. You know, you know, things change in that time. But here's what God wanted those people, and He wants us to know, God not forgot. He has not forgot His promise to the Jewish nation. He promised them that through David, He would take care of them and He would reconcile them unto Himself, even though they had been scattered and had been brought back together and had been scattered time and time again. He still made a promise to them, you are My inheritance, and I will make a way that I may have you forever. That was His plan. Well, in the 400 years after Malachi, nobody was prophesying. Nothing was really taking place. Life was going on as usual. The Pharisees were going through the motions, <clears throat> and I say going through the motions of reading the scrolls and applying the law and adding their own things to it. And there was a system of religion that was taking place, but there was no spirit in it. There, there, was, no, there was no life in it. It was just a ritual is all it was. And the people just put it into perspective as another part of their life. They go to work, they go to synagogue, they, they go through the festivals, and it's all over. Listen, we're not a lot different than they are. Our lives become ritualistic. Christmas becomes a particular season of the year for us. And we tend to think more in the sense of Christ coming to us in the sense of Christmas. But just like Billy's son back there, that son was born, he is always going to be Billy's son. Billy's not going to say, well, since he's been born, all that's over with. I don't have... No, it, it's going to be an involvement for the rest of their lives. And that's what John wanted these Jews to understand about their relationship with God. He makes it clear to them and to us, that Jesus was not just a man of God. He was not just a man who had the Word of God. He was fully God. He is the Word, which is God Himself. That's what John wanted them to know. And he built upon that, and Jesus built upon that in the book of Revelation. We haven't got to this chapter yet. We probably will in another year or two. That's a joke. We're getting, we're getting through that book. But in Revelation chapter 19, in verse 13, here's what we're told. He, talking about the Lord, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And what? His name is called the Word of God. There it is. Foremost and upfront 
and in your face. So there's no doubt who John is talking about when he talks about the Word. He's making a direct connection between the God of the Old Testament that the Jews called the Word, and he said, this God, the Word, has now become flesh. Well, that was just totally unheard of. The Egyptians had hundreds of gods that they worshipped. The other nations had hundreds of gods that they worshipped, but they'd never seen any of them. They, most of them made their own gods out of wood or stone, or there were carvings, or man made something and called it God. Man's always been good at doing that. Man has always been able to take something and, and make something and find something to, to worship. But aren't you glad that God made man? And man didn't have to make our God that He made us. And John wanted to, to get them to understand just what a big deal this was that God became human. That's a major undertaking. Just think about that for a minute. Just ponder on that. You, you can ponder on it when you got more time, mainly when you're, when you're in your alone time with God, whether it's in your car, wherever it might be. But just think about how awesome God is. Everything that's made, He made it. Nothing exists that He didn't make. Oh, oh, I know we as humans have manufactured things, but everything that we manufacture comes from what He made. And He has given us a sense to do what we do and to know what we know. Nothing exists without Him. It's like the two scientists who, who told God they had figured out how to make a man. And God said, really? And they said, yeah, we know how to make a man. And God said, well, show me. Show me how you make this man. And one of the scientists took his little beaker and a spoon and he went outside the laboratory and he knelt down on the ground and was going to scoop some dirt into the beaker. And about the time he got a scoop of dirt, a lightning bolt hit right at him. And he jumped up and God said, get your own dirt. Yeah, see, he, it's not something that anything that we have is, is created from something that already was. John wanted them to know that this awesome God who, who brought everything into existence, who owns everything, who controls, listen, He's way bigger than we are. When you talk about a big picture, it's a great big picture. Our minds can't encompass just how big and how awesome this God really is. But yet, yet, He became small enough to an extent that He would want to come to this planet that He had made in the form of His intelligent creatures that He had made. I have to wonder about the intelligence slipping away once in a while but still, we're the ones that communicate with Him, don't we, Dave? We're the ones He gave the ability to communicate with and to know who He is. I watch them little birds on those bird feeders. Listen, I don't know what relationship they have with the Father, but here's what I do know. He feeds them. He uses me to do it sometimes, but He's feeding them. He's making a way for them because He said... That's what He was going to do. And just as He cares for them, He cares for me. He, he said, not one of those sparrows. Everyone that comes to those feeders, He knows every one of them. And, and He cares about them, and He cares enough about me that He knows every hair on my head. That, that, and this is an awesome God that cares enough to do... It just, it just blows our mind. We just can't, we just can't imagine that. And we can't get a hold of that. But that's what John wanted us to know and wanted his audience to know. God Himself in a human body. Now there are those who make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is all there is. That Jesus is the only one. That there is no Father 
or Holy Spirit aside from the man Jesus Christ. That is not what the Scripture teaches us. The Scripture teaches us He is a triune God. He exists in three entities. He exists as the Father, the Grand Architect, the the Creator, but yet the Son, John said, was there in the creation too. And things that were made by the Father were made through the Son. And then the Holy Spirit, who is the one that had these words penned, He's the one that has guarded this message for thousands of years. He's the one that's telling me what this book says. He's the one that gives me what I can say about Him. The witness that I have towards Him. Now when I tell a joke, that's me. But when it's the Word, that's Him. That's Him. That's what He does. And He was in this human body, and the human body became a divine, that that means godly, it became a divine body. The only one that ever was, and the only one that ever will be, until we are in our glorified bodies, and with Him in the place He has prepared for us. There is not another divine being on this earth. He was it, and He's the only one. And He still exists. And He did that for us. Because He could not reconcile us to Himself just as we are. Can I say it as Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham would say it? We're not good enough, and we never will be good enough under our own power. And once we realize that, then our next question should be, then what do we do? We believe upon Christ. He is the one who came to do what we cannot do for ourselves. That's why John made it a point to say Jesus was not born by the will of the flesh. I was born by the will of the flesh. You were too. Your parents wanted a kid. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. I mean, we were born by will of the flesh. And it wasn't man's idea. It wasn't the fact that man could say, well... Let's see if we can create us a God to worship. (laughs) It wasn't of man, but it was of God. God did it Himself. And that's no secret. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 5, pay close attention to what God tells us here. Therefore, given all the other things that's already said before, When He came into the world, that's Jesus the writer's talking about. When He came into the world, He said, and this is a mixture of some psalms here, He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body, a body you have prepared for Me. Jesus said, So so the body that was prepared for God was named Jesus. Are you with me on that? Your, Your body has a name. Somebody named you, Charles. Your mama said, I've got a I got a body here and I'm going to name it. This body which God created himself, planted inside that virgin himself was birthed under His umbrella at body to which He was going to come into, He made Himself. Think about that. Just think about that. He created a body, a body that He may feel for Himself. Because the sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. That word desire, that word means satisfy. And we look at that and we say, well, God didn't desire sacrifice. Why did He have them do it all? Listen, they did what they did for the same reason that Abraham was counted righteous because he believed God. Everything they did in that old sacrificial system had nothing to do with really forgiving their sin. It had to do with being obedient unto God. 
It had to do with their, with their obeying His Word. That's the righteousness they had. They did what He said to do. Aren't you glad today that we don't have to do certain things in order to have His favor? Huh? You are glad about that. Because if we did, this old boy would fall short. This old boy wouldn't be able to measure up to that which I would have to do to find favor with God. But John said, I don't have to worry about that because he said in the last verse I read to you, in his fullness, we have, we have received, we have received, not them, we have received grace for grace. And that grace is the grace of God. Grace is simple. Grace is simple. Grace means that we can't, we can't determine what God wants to do with us apart from what He determines He wants to do with us. You know, He has the right to save us or not. That was His decision. It was His decision to prepare a body for Himself to come into. It was His decision to make that sacrifice for me and you. It wasn't anything we deserve. It wasn't anything the human race did. He didn't owe us anything. He didn't say, well, I promised this to him, so i got to do it now. No, it was because He wanted to do that. It was by His grace. Grace is getting that which we don't deserve. Grace is getting that for which we had nothing to do with, but yet He gave it to us anyway. Isaiah prophesied that. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, the prophet Isaiah declared, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Will give you a sign of what? He will give you a sign of who the Messiah is, the Savior. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call Him, there's underlining in italics again, and will call Him Emmanuel, God with us. That's how that's translated. God with us. The virgin will give birth to a child. That doesn't happen naturally. We know how childbirth works, but this happened supernaturally. That God made this happen. And this is a sign for us that this child is the Messiah. And not only is this child the Savior, this child is God Himself. Emmanuel is God with us. Now, some have said, listen, if His name was to be called, if His name was to be Emmanuel, why did they name Him Jesus? Because He's both. Because He's both. Well, why did Mary name him Emmanuel? Because Emmanuel is what they will call him, not what they named him. The angel said, You will name him Jesus, Yahshua, which means God saves. God with us, and God saves. You will call him Emmanuel. You will say that he is God with us. John the Baptist was called the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But that wasn't his name. But when they referred to John the Baptist, when they referred to the voice of one crying in the wilderness, they knew who they were talking to. Jesus is called Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is also called the Lamb of God. But that's not His name. His name is Jesus. That's the name of the body that God created that would be sacrificed for our sins. But that body contained Almighty God. God with us. And He had, he had to become a human in order that we might be saved. The reason He had to do that. 
Hebrews chapter 10, same chapter, the writer continues. That's a good chapter if you've got time to read it. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 and 10. By that will, and that's the will of God doing what He wanted to do, by that will we have been sanctified. Sanctified means you've been made a saint. You have been set apart by God's will. How? Through the offering of the body. See? There's the emphasis again. We were sanctified. We were saved. We were chosen through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. No other body could have been killed that could reconcile us unto God. The Apostle John. John was a good evangelist. Dr. Luke. Luke was a good doctor. Mark was a good writer. Paul was a good apostle and evangelist. But none of them can save us. It was not the death of none of their bodies. Stephen was the first martyr. But Stephen was saved by the first death of Jesus Christ. By that body which God had said, this is the body that will reconcile us to God. Think Think about that. Think about that. That body that God created to come into for the very purpose of going from that manger to that cross that we might come out of the grave just as He did. And when He went to heaven and prepared a place for us and is there now waiting until that moment that He will come again just as He did the first time and take those who are born again with Him in the rapture to be where He is forever and ever. Well, why did He want to do it that way? Why didn't He just make a world and put all of us in it and live? Because He didn't want to. He's God, guys. He can do what He wants to do. It was His sovereignty. This is His plan. He, he didn't... He didn't say, what do you think, Mike? You think this will work? <laughs> he gave it to me and said, make it work! Because this is what I have chosen to do, and this is how I have chosen to do it. Christmas was a big deal. It was a big deal. Because once God came into the world through that body and dwelt among us, listen, He's never left us. He's never left us. Jesus went back. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I will come unto you. On the day of Pentecost, they understood what that meant. And the Holy Spirit, which is God as well, is now present. On He's the one that's here. He's the one that makes this Word work. He's the one that gives truth. To that which I say. He's the one that tells me these things. He's the one that preaches the messages. He's the one that testifies of Jesus. And He hasn't gone anywhere. He's the one when you think, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to God. He's the one that's going to make sure that happens. He's the one that hears what you have to say. He's the one that takes that request unto God. All that was made possible because of Christmas. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. But it's not just a once a year thing. Every day is Christmas. Every day is Christmas for us. We may not give the gifts and fix the dinners and eat the ham and do, but we should. <laughs> we really should. Because every day is Christmas. Every day we should be just as excited about God every day as we are at just Christmas. No, Christmas was major. John said, the Word, which is this message, the word logos in the Greek, which is the message. This is who God is. He is who He says He is. And we are who He says we are. That's why he made it a point to say those who believe that, that he came in the flesh, 
that he died on the cross, that he was resurrected, and that he ascended back to the Father, and that he's coming again. Those who really believe that about Jesus and want to be a part of that, he will give us the right to become children of God. John made that clear. So he was telling them, rejoice. Just as the angel has said, I bring you good news. Great news. Because because of this child, humanity can be reconciled to God the Father. I don't know about you, but I'm glad He reconciled me to the Father. I'm glad that He tore down that which separated us and opened it up so that I can have that salvation offered by Him. Grace for grace. Isn't that a good message? Isn't that good news? Woo! Father, we thank You today. Thank You for these who are here. They're here because they love You. Thank You for Christmas. Thank You that You prepared this body and Yourself came into this body. I realize to those who are not born again, it, it probably doesn't make any difference to them one way or another. They think it's just a nativity scene. But to those of us who know You, to those of us who have been born again, to those of us that You live in our hearts, oh, it's a big deal. It becomes so much more because we begin to realize just how much we are loved by You and that it was by Your grace that You chose to do what You did. So help us, Holy Spirit, to always remember that and to turn unto You. And regardless of what's going on, in the world around us, just as it was in the day that Jesus was born. You're still God. You're still who You say You are in Your Word. You still keep Your promises. You're still able to do that which You said You're going to do. And whether we believe it or not doesn't change it because it's the truth. And You are the truth. So we thank You, Lord, that You loved us enough to do that for us. Now go with us and help us in all that we do to glorify You in our lives, to glorify You in our bodies. As the Apostle Peter said, that we might be ready to give a defense or a testimony for the hope that You have put in our hearts. And we'll give You the thanks for it. In Your name, Jesus, we pray. And the saints would say, we love You, Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you. We're planning on being here Wednesday night for Bible study. So hope you can make it.